In today's video, we are going to be discussing all about my home-built double wishbone front suspension from the Mustang right here. So if you're interested in suspension design or want to know why I did certain things that I did, this is the video for you, so stay tuned. Welcome. So this is my double wishbone front suspension that I designed and built myself. It's out of the car right now for some upgrades, so I thought it was the perfect time to take a deeper look into its design and why I did certain things, why it's not the greatest or some improvements that need to be done. Everything is a compromise, but we'll kind of dig a little bit deeper into that. I know that looking at it like inside the car isn't always the easiest, so that's why I figured why I had it out, I would build it all back up and we can actually take close looks to everything, which is gonna be pretty awesome. So let's get a little bit closer look. Here I'll show the suspension kind of going up and down in its uh, movement, as we have this uh, nice coilover uh, test fixture here. So as you can see, it is a completely bolt in design. Nothing is actually welded to the car. It has basically this uh, bracket up here that sandwiches the frame and kind of goes in between and uses the, the bolts from the, the K member to hold, hold it in. The, the K member is factory. It has been heavily modified and I'll kind of go over some of those modifications that I had to do. The spindle is a stock SN95 one with a Griggs adapter on the top. It's got a fabricated lower control arm, a purchased upper control arm, a fabricated bracket, and a fabricated coilover uh, upper mount. This is a fairly common design for the suspension on the Mustangs to do a bracket that uh, goes in here. For the adjustments that I have for doing like alignment kind of things, to do the camber, there's basically a shim plate that goes in here to move the upper arm in and out. So these, uh, shims you have multiple different sizes that you can get that kind of slip right in there so you can see that i have a, a 3 16th one in there right now is three eight three quarters there's some smaller ones the bigger ones that kind of go in there that will move the the upper part of the suspension in and out i can also adjust the the lower control arm there's a uh, rod ends on there that can be adjusted in or out it is way more time consuming to do those because you got to disassemble a lot of things to be able to turn that uh, rod end or turn the whole uh lower control arm in or out so the easiest adjustment is to do this one, but if you run out of adjustment up here, then you need to start messing with the, the, lower, the lower arm. To do caster, so that's moving the suspension forward or back, basically in the vertical plane, there's these uh, little shims up in this uh, upper arm. So there's ones with a uh, different hole placing, so you can basically move this arm forward and back. And that uh, is the easiest way to do the caster again i can also adjust the rear arm on here because it's uh it's threaded on both ends so we can just loosen up the jam nuts and can spin this in and out which will pull push the lower portion of the arm forward or back as well so you can kind of get like fine tuning done with that arm this will do uh, larger adjustments so that I could do the fine tuning with uh, this one. So here we can see how uh, the coilover kind of is really close on everything. So even as the arm comes up, which I can't do right now with uh, this coilover in here, but when this uh, is up at its right height and when it's uh, coming up, it gets really close to this uh, spring. And one of the things about uh, coilover springs is they're all the same ID but as you go thicker, that means the OD has to get bigger to be a uh, thicker winding. So the ID is uh, controlled, but the OD gets bigger. So that is one thing that I did uh, not really account for when I started going up into larger uh, spring rates was uh, this OD getting much larger. So that is one reason that I actually had to make this new bracket. This isn't my original design of how I attach the upper uh, upper coil over and then the rear i can't really go you want to be as close to the ball joint as possible to help with your motion ratio but as i go closer to that i start getting uh interference with um, the upper control arm and things things of that nature another thing about these control arms is they are a little on the larger side and with uh using the factory spindle I'm basically at the limit of my tires. So you can see that the tires have contacted the upper control arm. 
So I'm at a 10 and a half inch uh, width wheel at the moment. And I just, I can't go any larger or else I start hitting this uh, upper control arm. So some things I, that I can do is get a different upper control arm design that's uh, more straight to the, the ball joint to get rid of these uh, little bends and curves out here. But uh, that would be a completely different uh, manufacturer or a custom design one to be able to do that. Another option to try to get away from this upper control arm is to do a drop spindle. So that is something that I might look into in the future is if you uh, raise this pickup point of your tire up higher, it puts this more into the center of the wheel and gets this away from the, the, the rim a little bit more. It might still contact uh, during turning, so it's something that I would have to try to model up and take a look at. You'll also notice that there is some angle done up in here. Uh, so there are two holes that I can change the angle of this arm to get more uh, anti-dive if I want it. So right now it's on the bottom hole in the back and the top hole on the front. So it's the most aggressive uh, anti-dive right now. And here you can see those uh, holes. You can see that they're square holes and that these are uh, button heads. I did that so these can get as close to the frame as possible as I was talking about. And since they're square holes, they got a, a square part on the, the bolt itself. These can't rotate. So that's how I'm able to tighten up the upper control arms and be able to have these not actually rotate. Another problem that I have with this suspension design is the sway bar pickup mount out here. So it's kind of off the center line of the control arm. So it's putting a moment or twisting on this lower control arm every time that it's uh, kind of re that the sway bar is reacting to to roll, which is then putting some uh, force into this uh, rear link, which it doesn't like bending. These these rod ends don't like bending. So. One of the things that I want to do is either change up the lower control arm to where it comes out more and picks up this point or change the sway bar or sway bar mounting to where it can mount uh, more in the center line of the of the control arm to get those forces more direct in there. Let's talk K member modifications. So first off, you'll notice that I had to basically cut this off to give me some clearance, which was where the spring bucket is. So there's no spring bucket anymore. That has all been cut out of there. I did have to add in kind of this piece to add in some uh, rigidity back to it, but that is uh, pretty easy. Then for the, the mounting of my control arms. So I built a little uh, bracket in there that has three holes and welded uh, that into there instead of trying to modify this center section or cutting the holes. So it's all bolted basically to this bracket that is then welded into the K member. And it has three different holes in it. So it has the lower hole, which is the stock hole, which is basically not being used, but it was there for alignment purposes as I put in the bracket. Then there's another hole that is one inches up and then the top hole, which is two inches higher than stock. So those two holes are basically the same thing that a lot of the aftermarket K members out there are doing as well. And that improves your, your roll center, center and camber curve. So right now I am in the top hole. And then for the rear, since you have this plate back here, it really limits trying to put a bolt going through there as you can like in the front. So I actually turned it 90 degrees. I had seen other K member or other uh, suspension systems kind of do this. So there is a bracket that is then welded in there and I'm able to basically just shim it up with a uh, shim. So it's basically at the same height as the front one at the moment. And I can change that height very easily by just relocating those shims. And it has plenty of movement on, on the ball. I have a high misalignment or high angle a uh, ball joint in there of the proper size. So it it's never had any issues of binding. It can go way more than the suspension actually can go. Right now, my binding points are on the ball joints. My ball joints bind, as you can see, we're at the lowest point that it can go right now. And then as we go, as we go up, it binds again on the ball joint. That is my binding points at the moment, it would be good to try to fix those. But in order to fix those 
is going to need probably a whole new spindle i think to really get those to be proper but right now i have plenty of movement for what i'm actually because this would basically be ride height at the moment uh, i kind of try to keep ride height to where this uh, lower control arm is is horizontal so that's basically my ride height and then we have plenty of movement uh, going up and down one last thing to mention is the the ball joint so these are how racing ball joints and then you, these are actually you can get different ones these are completely uh rebuildable so you can get different uh balls in there so i actually have one this bottom one is a five so that's 0.5 inches uh taller and i believe the top one is also a 0.5 uh taller one so that is also to help with uh, the roll center and camber curve and things like that to kind of get things away and get the proper angles of where we need need things to be. So as you can see there, with the lower control arm being level, the upper control arm has an angle going uh, upward. So that means we're, we're gaining, as we go up, we are gaining negative camber as we're moving uh, upward. The same, the same can kind of be true that we're, uh, as we're dipping down, that we could be gaining a little bit of positive as this is crossing over, the upper arm is crossing over its uh, longest point right there. But then again, as it goes down, we're gaining negative camber. So some specs of the suspension. So I can get a max of like negative four degrees uh, camber with just removing this and pushing that in. And then we can get a whole lot more if we actually adjust out this uh, lower control arm. Caster, I got I got tons of caster any which way that I want to go. Right now it's uh, set up to around uh, five degrees of uh, positive caster with this uh, zero in there. The, the camber curve, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's around one degree per inch. Might be a little less, uh, but that stuff is all lit, is basically limited by your where you can get your upper control arm and where you can get your lower control arm so the lower control arm obviously is going in basically the factory location and then your upper arm has to be so short due to the the frame rail that goes through here so if you're able to get rid of the frame rail then uh you can get a lot more in there and you kind of see looking at this my with the angle that i have in my upper arm uh, it's below where the frame rail would actually be so we can't really cut into the frame rail there And then this one is kind of getting to the top of where the frame rail would be So if I was going to try to do any kind of pocket into the frame rail We would have to remove a lot of the anti-dive which is is possible it is okay to do that I just would probably maybe need to run a little bit more spring so speaking of spring rates right now we have 800 pound springs on the JRI double adjustable coilovers. Let me start taking some of this apart and we can take a little bit deeper dive into the design. Here is the upper bracket. So you can kind of see the, the square holes that are, that are in there and these uh, carriage bolts. So these things are uh, pretty sweet. So square on there, make it up to where it can go in, lock in. The only problem with them is I'd have to take the bracket all the way out to, in order to move to a different hole. So that is one of the drawbacks, but I'm not really changing the, the holes. And another thing, not just any dive, uh, moving this upper arm up and down can change my uh, roll center. So that was one reason that I had that adjustment in there. Same with the K member. If we move uh, these holes up and down, it will change out our, our roll center. So it's a, a easy way to raise or lower our roll center, depending on what we're uh, trying to achieve or the ride height that we're at. The, the K member, as you can see a little bit more clearly here, is the, the cut that was uh, done along there. One of the reasons that I use the stock K member is one, to re reduce the cost. Uh, so obviously we already had this, 
so I didn't have to really factor in any new costs for uh, aftermarket K-Mubber because those things are quite expensive. Uh, anywhere from $500 to $900 uh, is those uh, the K-Mubbers. So this kept our cost really low, uh, just being able to modify it. And also just to test out the, the geometry, to test out, uh, see what the geometry changes actually will do to for the for the car now that we have it uh flipped upside down you can kind of see the bracketry that's going on there a little bit clearer so a c channel in the front with uh, three different holes and a c channel in the rear that we do with uh spacers as we mentioned and the bolt kind of goes in i have to do the bolt from the bottom instead of the top which is not ideal i'd much rather have the bolt come in from the top so in case we lost the nut uh we wouldn't lose the whole uh bolt out and the control arm but uh you can't fit the bolt from the the top unfortunately so that will be one advantage of being able to flip it in the in the future uh going back uh front to back but yeah that was not ideal so i did have a lock nut on there to make sure that that hopefully didn't ever come out uh, you could also see the sway bar mount up here and then uh, this rear adjustment uh better better view of that. So this does just uh, turn. So we got a left-handed and a right-handed uh, thread on there. I think it's called like a strut tube or suspension tube or something, something of that nature. Uh, you can get these in multiple different sizes. This is a 10 inch one to kind of make uh, the geometry uh, work there. But yeah, that is what's going on uh, with those, with those attachments. That is an overview of my home built suspension. A lot of compromises due to, uh, for one, cost of just trying to keep the cost down and reasonable. So I will be uh, probably upgrading the spindles. That is the highest cost uh, thing to get some aftermarket spindles. Uh, so I think I will be upgrading those in the future to kind of get some better uh, geometry that we kind of uh, talked about there. And then you're really limited by where the frame rail is located in these cars. So you just can't get the upper arm to be any longer. And then the lower arm, you're also limited by the, the mounting points and geometry that's in there. You could maybe uh, build your own K-member that moves those further inboard, I would think, but you still need to have the proper, uh, you know, load pass going back into the frame. All the force needs to go back into the, the frame rail and be distributed through through the car but that is in a nutshell my front suspension that i have on the car uh, is pretty standard for other ones that are out there so hopefully you guys learned something and if you enjoyed this hit the subscribe button we'll have some more improvements coming on the car a lot of other things coming along as well since this thing is pulled out at the moment that's why this is pulled out. We got some good stuff coming. So stay tuned. Thank you guys for watching. See you later.